This week on Gulf New England, Mike Dowling interviews Greg Norman and Paul Fireman at the Celebrity Pro-Am at Willow Bend. Boston Globe Gulf writer Paul Harbour takes us to a grave situation in Rhode Island. Ken Bell visits Pleasant Valley Country Club as they prepare for their annual PGA Tour stop. And Mike Rattay visits one of the few True Links courses in America. Welcome to the premier edition of Golf New England. I'm your host, Mike Dowling, here at Willow Bend Country Club in Mashpee, Paul Fireman's Retreat here on Cape Cod. We're at the Children's Charity Golf Tournament, which brings some of the biggest names in golf here to New England for a one-day pro amateur tournament. Who has the best score here really isn't important. The real winners are the children who benefit from the ticket sales. Thank you. It's a pleasure. When we come back, we'll take a closer look at the Willow Bend Club and Paul Fireman, the man whose vision has made this one of the best facilities in all of New England. From the time Paul Fireman purchased Willow Bend four years ago, he has done his best to make this the finest course in all of New England. Paul Fireman rehired architect Michael Hurston and they have made several critical changes, eliminating a few of the weaker holes and adding stronger ones. Today it is a championship course, good enough now to hold any sort of tournament, including a Ryder Cup. He has put his heart and soul into this club just as he did when he purchased Reebok, making it one of the top athletic shoe companies in the world. Well, Paul, first of all, what inspired you to buy Willow Bend? I came over to Willow Bend a few times and it was established by uh, Dean Hofstetter and Jack Lage, and it was an excellent place, and I started to play here a few times, and then unfortunately they got in trouble, and I just followed where they were going with it, and eventually when the Resolution Trust uh, put it up for auction, uh, I asked Dean if he minded if I bid, or was he going to continue to bid, and he said he was going to back away, and I took the opportunity. I mean, was that always been a dream of yours to own a golf course, or? Not really, no, I mean, I've always enjoyed golf and play golf, but um, no, I never thought in terms of owning a golf course. I just thought in terms of, uh, you know, enjoy playing on them. But, you know, the opportunity was there. It was a moment in time. So I figured it would be a great idea and see where it took us. And obviously it's taken us a long way. Paul, how'd you come up with the idea of having this children's charity golf tournament? I, I grew up as a caddy at Thorny Lee and Brockton. And I've always been attached to the idea that, you know, young people need to be rejuvenating the game of golf at all times. It improves the conditions for young people, children in the community of Mashpee and Pituit and other areas around this Cape Cod, and as well as the opportunity for people to learn from the experience that golf's about giving, not just taking. How close would you say this tournament is to where you would like it to be? It's, it's doing really well. I mean, we've got 24 uh, excellent pros here this year, and I think the, the issue is not just the size, the issue is the quality. And I think they have Greg Norman and John Cook and Michael Mirror and Brad Fax and Gary Player this year. Uh, it's just wonderful opportunity. I know you have a good crowd out here watching. It's a pretty tough ticket to play with these pros too, isn't it? You know, it's going, the money's going to charity and the money's also there to provide so that we can bring in the best in the world and give the people at Cape Cod and Boston community a chance to see these people. And I think that's just as important. You know, they can get up as close as can be here. There's no, you know, the ropes are very close to where they're gonna, gonna actually see the players. So it's an opportunity and obviously people who can afford to pay for it have to create that opportunity. Would you say the course right now, Willow Bend, is close to where you want it to be? Willow Bend was, was a great golf course before I bought it. Uh, the truth is that it, the natural landscaping is, the topography of any golf course is its natural limits. Uh, you can improve the ground and grass, but it's, it's the quality of what you know, nature and, and uh, divine beings bring it. And This is something that I think is, uh, was naturally here, and I just helped uh, give it love and care. Obviously, money helped, but I think the people that work here just work there their hats out to make it a great place. And right now, yeah, I think it's probably in the top three, four courses in New England right now. Well, thanks, Paul. You know, while Willow Bend is one of the newer courses on the Cape, Highland Links is one of the oldest. Mike Rattay takes a look at that classic course. If you play golf and love the game, you owe it to yourself to play Highland Links. 
No, it's not one of those ritzy resort courses, a playground for the rich and famous. You will not find it on any one of those top 100 lists either. It is only nine holes, and the conditions, well, this is not like anything you will find at your course back home. It is a one-of-a-kind course. Hello, I'm Mike Rutte with New England Destinations. Today we'll talk with Manny McCara. He's well-versed in all the history here and all its quirky weather conditions. When the wind comes up, it'll affect your putting on the greens. You, you have to be very unique in the type of shots you play. You have to keep the ball low. So it becomes very difficult sometimes here to play. Well, Cape Cod is of continuous change, changing sands, changing winds. Is there an erosion factor here? Well, we have one hole that's in danger right now, and as the, we keep on losing probably 5, 10, 15 feet, according to what the winter storms are doing on the sixth hole at the golf course. So I would say in the next 25 years or so, you might have to have a redesign of that particular hole. What's the best time to come out here and play the Highland Lakes? Well, if you're looking for the season, I would say in the spring or the fall when we're not busy. But just as soon as summer comes here, there's no good times to play the golf course because we, just as soon as daylight breaks until, until sunset, we're full. So during the week, probably Wednesday and Thursday, probably your best days you can play here. There are many things that make this course special. It has a colorful history. Great players like Francis Wimette and Bobby Jones used to summer on the Cape in East Ham in the 1920s and 1930s. Some afternoons they would show up unannounced and play. Alistair Cook, the English writer who hosted Masterpiece Theatre, loved Highland and called it the closest thing to a Scottish Lynx course in America. Sports Illustrated had an artist paint the ninth hole and claimed it to be one of the best short par threes in the world. The wind constantly blows here, forcing you to play a different game. It forces you to be creative, hitting low shots. The wind is always a factor, and sometimes it even affects when you're putting. This course today is not much different than when we met and Jones played here. It really hasn't changed in 75 years. In the 1890s, Highland House Hotel was a summer resort for the elite families of the Northeast. It was owned by Isaac Morton Small and his family. When his son Willard returned from college in 1892, he brought home a new game, golf. Like horseshoes and croquet, golf at Highland was just another game to play. There were no scorecards. The greens were little more than hard-packed sand. One green, in fact, was made out of cement. A famous New York opera star and avid golfer, J. Henry McKinley, changed the greens from sand to grass and modified the golf course in 1916. It does not look much different today. At the second hole, you aim your tee shot at the Jenny Lind Monument. This is the view along the 6th fairway. You have the ocean here, and then for now, we'll call this a deep natural rough. If you have a slice, leave it in your bag on this hole. The lighthouse here on the 7th hole is a distinctive backdrop with the ocean pounding along the cliffs. Highland Lakes will never make a list of top 100 courses, but it is very different and needs to be played to be appreciated. I'm Mike Rutte. We'll see you next time from another New England destination. Still ahead on Gulf New England, Ken Bell takes a look at the history and family tradition that is Pleasant Valley Country Club. This will be Greg Norman's last appearance here in New England. Because of his popularity, he has one of the most demanding schedules in all of golf. He has his own plane, and not only does he crisscross the world playing in tournaments, but now he and Willow Bend's Bob St. Thomas are in the process of building a championship course in Puerto Rico. Well, there are a lot of people following you around today, and a lot of media people wanted to talk to you. Do you get tired of this? No, I don't. Uh, you know, I, it, it's great. I mean, this is a position you put yourself in, and this is a position you have to accept. Uh, I'd rather have it this way. 
Um, it's a decision that you have to understand that there are certain players who don't want to have that responsibility and there are certain players who don't mind the responsibility. So as far as I'm concerned, it goes part of the territory. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes it gets a little bit draining on you because, you know, people want individual pieces. So every time you have somebody else for five or six minutes, it turns into an hour because there's always four or five other people wanting to do it. And that's where it gets a little bit hard because you, you just got to keep going over the same territory all the time. And I understand that, so, uh, you know, I accept it. Winning two tournaments in the last month, finishing second in another and fourth in the other, have you ever played better than this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. In 1986, I won 10 tournaments. I won six in a row. Um, there's been years that I've played better. Uh, yes, I mean, this is no uh, freak thing of people, you know, it's great, no question about it. I, I, it's a wonderful thing to go through a month like this. And it also tells me and gives me a lot of confidence in the fact that I could have easily won four tournaments in a row. I know you're taking a couple weeks off, uh, gearing up to the British Open. Is that uh, amongst your specific goals to win more major championships? That oh yeah, I mean, everybody should set goals. I am very much a goal-oriented individual. Uh, I set goals on a daily basis, on an hourly basis when I'm playing golf. Uh, yesterday I set myself a goal for the last three or four holes. Uh, you know, you have to motivate yourself. I can't just go out there and just do it. Now you've been in this children's charity event a couple of years. I mean, obviously you've known Paul Fireman for a while and that's how it stemmed. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've known him for a long time since my association with Reebok getting back to the late 80s. Uh, you know, we've had a, not only a good relationship in business, but a good relationship as friends. And I enjoy doing it because, you know, in our life is a great life. And when we, we, we get the opportunity of getting a lot out of it, the game of golf, and for us to come and be able to put a little bit back into it, like supporting Paul Feynman and the Children's Charities Days here, uh, is important to us. Okay, Greg, thanks for joining us, and uh, good luck in the British Open in a couple of weeks. Thank you. If you didn't get a chance to come down here to Willow Bend, you can see many of these same golfers in a couple of weeks when the PGA Tour stops at Pleasant Valley Country Club. Ken Bell takes a look at Pleasant Valley, a tour stop for the last 30 years. Carved out of a New England apple orchard, Pleasant Valley was the fruit of one man's dream, Cuzzy Mingola. This Massachusetts contractor loved golf and believed New England could support a major professional tournament. So in 1961, with the help of golf professional Don Honig, they took an apple orchard and transformed it into Pleasant Valley Country Club. Four years later, it hosted the Carling World Open. At the time, it had the largest purse on the PGA Tour, $200,000. The inaugural field included all the greats, from Ben Hogan and Arnold Palmer to Jack Nicklaus and Gary Player. Champagne Tony Lima, with a bit of luck, won the tournament. His approach shot, bound for a water hazard, caromed off a rock and landed on the green. It was the last tournament he would win before his tragic death in an airplane crash. Two years later, Pleasant Valley hosted the Kemper Open, won by Palmer, and his winning check made him the first golfer to surpass the $1 million mark in career earnings. In the early 1970s, it became one of the few courses to host both an LPGA and a PGA tournament during the same year. It was the home of the LPGA Championship for five years. Cousy Mingola no longer is with us, but his son Ted has picked up the torch and has continued his father's dream. Even though we've done it, this is the 30th year that the tour has come to Pleasant Valley, uh, and our, our people are in place every year. We're lucky in that way. Like my son Stephen is a tournament director, and most of our chairman and committee chairmen have been here for many, many years, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every year like a lot of tournaments do. It's, it's difficult. It's, it's not a fun thing to do. It, it's fun when it works well. But getting there sometimes is not easy. It's not an automatically easy, fun week for us. While Pleasant Valley is known as a tour site, its reputation as a golf course is lacking only because it wasn't built by a name architect like Donald Ross or Pete Dye. Don Honig from Connecticut was our pro. He and my father uh, just sort of laid the course out. That's why you'll never see us listed in the top five or top ten of any golf course listing because we, don't, we never had a real architect. And supposedly, you must have a recognized architect to have a good golf course. I don't think that's necessarily true, but we have since had many architects do work here. Nevertheless, it's a great track. It's a course ahead of its time. It is truly the PGA's first stadium course. Eight of its holes have tees or greens near the clubhouse. There are moundings at key areas, such as the 17th green. 
That all makes Pleasant Valley a splendid place to watch a golf tournament. The 17th is the signature hole at Pleasant Valley. Many times this PGA tournament is decided on hole number 17. New England's own Brad Faxon won the tournament right here on number 17 when he knocked in a 10-footer for a birdie. Brad can still feel the hairs on his arms stand up and he can hear the roar of the crowd that day. It is a picturesque hole, a par four of 420 yards. You hit a drive over a traditional covered bridge to a fairway that dog legs to the right. The tee shot is critical. If you pull it to the left, you wind up in the trees. If you try to cut down the dog leg and hit the trees, maybe punching out to the fairway. That is, if you can find your ball. If you hit a good tee shot, you still have 150 yards to a green that is fronted by a large pond. The last day of the tournament, the flag stick is always on the front edge near the water. It's a make or break hole. Pleasant Valley is a wonderful place to play golf. Pleasant Valley was the dream of one man, Cuzzy Mingola, but the dream is still alive today and belongs to his son, Ted, and his grandson, Steve. I'm Ken Bell. That's this week's Greens of Envy. Well, while Pleasant Valley Country Club certainly has one of the best golf courses in all of Massachusetts, now we go to Rhode Island and one of the best golf courses down there, Montauk Country Club, where Paul Harbor tells us that golf is a matter of life and death. Golf is a game for a lifetime. That's what the PGA claims, but there are some who would like to make it last a little longer. Hi, I'm Paul Harbor. We're at Montauk Country Club in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, where they have made it last a little longer. When a member passes on at Thorny Lee in Brockton, Massachusetts, the club plants a tree for him. At Wollaston Golf Course in Milton, they carve his name in a grill room table. Sam Volpe and wife Ethel sleep for eternity. They're in a mausoleum on the 18th tee at Round Hill on Cape Cod. And then there's Dr. Leonard Buck of Portland, Maine. He isn't dead yet, but he has purchased his gravestone. His epitaph, I'd rather be golfing. But here at Montop, they're preoccupied with mortality. All you have to do is look at the club insignia. There's a golf flag, a pear tree, a shaft of wheat, and yes, tombstones. A few years ago, one Montauk member wanted to be buried in the golf course, but the town of Portsmouth wouldn't permit it. However, it allowed his ashes to be interred in a sorrow tree planted between the 11th tee and the 16th green. It cost him $2,000, but I don't think he misses it now. That isn't why gravestones are part of the club logo. When you play the 17th hole, you realize why. If you dub your tee shot, you could wind up in the middle of an 18th century cemetery. Yes. There is a burial plot on the fairway. <laughs> That's a different sort of hazard. Montauk was an old New England farm and pear orchard before it became a golf course in the Roaring Twenties. In the 60s, it expanded from nine to 18 holes. So what did they do? They built the 17th hole around the old cemetery. Who's buried here? The Rhode Island Historical Society isn't sure. All they know is it's 200 years old and there are eight bodies buried in this 20 foot by 20 foot lot. You can hardly make out the names. One that you can read states, Louis Green, son of Reuben T. and Jane E. Green, nine months and five days, October 3rd, 1811. There have been stories about ghosts in the clubhouse, babies crying and cooing in the attic. Members say they are the spirits of those who are buried in the cemetery. So, if you hit your ball into the cemetery on the 17th hole at Montauk, tread softly. I'm Paul Harbor, and that's this week's Pinpoints. Well, we're here with the Boston Globe's Paul Harbor, and Paul, I'm sure you forced yourself to play Montauk once or twice. How do you like it? I played it several times, and it's a great track. It has a couple of strong holes. The best thing about it, though, it's between two bodies of water, and it doesn't freeze during the winter. So when your course back home is frozen, go down there and play. Okay, I'll remember that one. And if you want a golf tip, we'll be right back with one. Chip Johnson of Pembroke Country Club is going to tell us how to help our game. Stay with us. Hi, my name's Chip Johnson from Pembroke Country Club. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit about getting out of a slump. With me today is Mary Ellen Stangolini. 
This morning we'll talk a little bit about the grip. First thing I would always look at when covering the fundamentals is the grip and the alignment of the hands according to the club face. It's important that you get the golf club square or the face pointing straight up in the air. At this point, put your left hand on in such a way that the V formed by your forefinger and your thumb point to your right shoulder. Right hand goes on securely and also the V also points to the right shoulder. Why don't you take a practice ring, Mary Ellen? I think if you cover the grip first, the game will be right back on track. This is Chip Johnson with Back to Basics. Hi, guys. Hi, yeah. <laughs> How are you? Great, thank you. There was plenty of action at the Pro-Am. Reg Norman drew a large gallery. And everyone wanted to see John Daly hitting those tee shots. Brad Faxon saw an old familiar face. Yes, that's his grandfather. Gary Player is the Peter Pan of golf he never ate. Orville Moody, winner of the U.S. Open and the U.S. Senior Open, is the best putter with the long stick. Former Pleasant Valley champions Wayne Levy and Blaine McAllister drew a crowd. And New England celebrities had a large following. Bobby Orr is as popular today as when he played for the Bruins. Thanks, Bobby. Roger Clemens showed his stuff. Oh, yeah. As there was plenty happening at Willow Bend last Monday. Thanks for joining us here in the premier edition of Golf New England. Join us the week of August 5th from the Idean Classic at Pleasant Valley.